Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. In this episode, we take a look at life aboard a science research vessel. We follow four journalist volunteers as they each spend two weeks working with scientists to better understand what a research cruise is like and how scientists study open ocean food webs. These volunteer journalists are on board the Kilo Moana as part of a media internship program working to improve their science communication skills. University of Hawaii students in the program are able to earn credits and receive scholarships in this unique partnership that looks to improve the public's understanding of scientific research. This cruise is led by oceanographer Jeff Drazen aboard the research vessel Kilo Moana. The Kilo Moana is a 186-foot ship owned by the Navy, but operated for research purposes by the University of Hawaii and stationed in Honolulu Harbor. First, our journalist volunteers, Dieter Stelling and Brian Berkowitz, share their experience on board the Kilo Moana. I'm Dieter Stelling. I'm one of the videographers aboard the Kilo Moana. I'm gonna show you the room. This is our shiny Ritz-Carlton housing. It's actually really nice. Yeah, we have bunk beds, closets, everything we need. We even have a TV. Where's the bathroom? Right here. As you can see, we're a very organized bunch. Very clean. We just got here how long? How long have we been on the boat? Uh, probably like an hour. I also helped out with a lot of the projects that were going on, so a lot of grunt work. Um, and it was a lot of fun to kind of leave my humdrum office life and just get out there, do some science. It was good. Hi, my name is Brian Berkowitz. On board the Kilo Moana, we're filming for the show Voice of the Sea. It's about um, bringing awareness to science and science education. So we're here with a bunch of UH and other uh, academic organizations, UH researchers, uh, about 20, 20 researchers, about 20 crew. We are approaching Station Aloha. I'm out at Station Aloha. Station Aloha. 60 nautical miles northwest of Oahu, the 100 square mile area of ocean, known as Station Aloha, serves as a research zone for a variety of oceanography projects. By concentrating studies together in this location, scientists are better able to form a complete picture of the marine ecosystem. This research cruise is focused on studying the transfer of energy in the open ocean ecosystem, from microscopic particles to large fish like tuna. The scientists use chemical signatures, known as isotopes, to track the path of energy through the food web. Dieter and Brian introduce us to the challenges of doing science at sea as they work around the clock, helping researchers deploy equipment and collect samples. I'm Kristen, I'm a graduate student in Jeff Jason's lab at the University of Hawaii. Um, so right now we're about to pass around the station Aloha buoy, and we've got these uh, fishing lines out because we're going to try to catch some tuna, and tuna tend to aggregate around buoys. So it's a good spot to do some hot predator sampling. What are you going to do when you catch the tuna? If we catch some tuna, we're going to take a small tissue sample from the white muscle in the tuna and we're going to run some stable isotope analysis on it to look at some different food web. Okay, what do you do with the rest of the tuna? We uh, save it. <laughs> Great. My name is Trevor Young. I'm one of the marine technicians. And uh, our job is essentially to provide an interface between the ship's crew and its mates and the science party. So we're the ones that do all this deck rigging that you see around here. Uh, we direct operations on the deck and we manage all the IT and data logging and other instrumentation on board the ship. My name is Josh, uh, I'm a res tech with Scripps and basically I'm here to babysit this instrument. It's a 10 meter mock nest. Um, it's used basically to collect uh, fish or other biology floating in the middle of the water column. So the idea is you send it down with one net open uh, then you close that net and you have another net that's open at whatever depth that the chief scientist over here decides. And uh, 
you know, we tow it for several hours and get all the biology samples from, you know, a very specific depth in the water column. Um, and then on the way back up, we'll, you know, close nets one by one and uh, they'll get different samples from different parts of the water column. So I'm basically here just to make sure this thing goes in and out right and set it up and break it down. So uh, yeah, hopefully everything goes as planned. The first thing that we have on this schedule, we are hopefully going to be on station about uh, no later than 7 o'clock tonight and launching the, the 10 meter mock. That net tow will last until 3 in the morning. Um, all of the mock tows are pretty long, guys. So um, they'll, we'll sort that trawl. But right after the mock comes up, we're going to get the CTD and, and uh, the plane pumps rigged, and hopefully those will be casted by 3.30 in the morning. It's a short first cast, and hopefully it'll be recovered in three hours. But that's how much time we have. It could be shorter if you wanted it, Hillary. Tell me, what, what are you all doing tonight? We're going to do our first deployment of the 10 meter mock. And then we're going to go to sleep yeah. while it's flying so, so that we're awake at 2 a.m. when it comes back in and we process it for hours. What time is it right now? Uh, about quarter to seven at night. And then, we're shooting for deployment between seven and eight, about. Okay. Seven, eight in the morning, seven, eight at night. Yeah. going to sneak behind you here. And then recovery is between two and three, usually. And what do you expect to get in the net? Hatchet fishes, angler fishes, angler fishes, angler fishes ice eels. Uh, we are mostly excited about the little buttless. Oh no, buttless wonders are the small. Yeah, mola molas, little reef fishes, which are super cute, yeah. and the top layers and a um, bunch of crustaceans. All right. Well, we'll check in at uh, three in the morning. Awesome. Uh, we just deployed the uh, mock nest net. Uh, so that's an uh, operation that employs the A-frame, which is the large crane on the back deck and a uh, capstan over here, which pulls lines in, and that gave us our, our sort of safety while we were taking up the slack from the winch wire. And uh, we had two tag lines on the side. Those give the mock nests uh, stability side to side so the thing doesn't bounce in between the rails of the A-frame. There's rollers, as you can see, on the back deck right there, and the frame just rolls right off the back of those. The uh, net is in the water. We zero all the electronics and recording equipment, and then we're going to shoot the net all the way down to 1,500 meters depth. And that'll be a payout of about 3,000 meters of wire. Who gets to sleep and who gets to fly? Uh, I'm going to be up for most of this one. I might take a nap right before it comes up. Uh, I think that you guys should probably sleep for this one to make sure that there's you're fresh for sorting the net, I catch. Whenever the mock nest is in, I'm around. So he's up for four days? Yeah. <laughs> Two days. Yeah, we'll see. Sneak some naps in. Now we have six full nets of Critters, and it's great. A little baby sawtooth eel, and then a larger guy right here. Get their name sawtooth eel because right inside their big mouth, right on the top of the jaw, in between, actually in between the jaws, there's a ridge and it has saw like teeth all along it. So basically, they have a saw blade in the top of their jaw. And they eat all kinds of fishes and shrimps and, and other things. What depth is that found at? So this guy we caught in the haul between about uh, 700 and meters and 500 meters, so somewhere, somewhere in that range. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program. 
focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii's Sea Grant. Welcome back to Voice of the Sea. Researchers Joel Bloom and Laura Mota from the University of Michigan explain their role studying the transfer of mercury in the ocean's food web. My name is Joel Bloom. I'm a professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Michigan. And I'm here on the Kilimoana uh, studying the cycling of mercury around the planet and in particular in the Pacific Ocean. Um, I've been working on understanding the chemistry of mercury on the Earth's surface for uh, the last 15 or 20 years. And uh, my research uh, has taken me many different places in the world. Uh, most of that has been done on, on land. And uh, this is my, my first oceanographic cruise and I'm out here uh, sampling and studying mercury uh, in the Pacific Ocean and in the, the marine food webs here. Mercury is a very, has a very complicated environmental chemistry to it. It, it changes forms, it's released in one place on the globe and will move around the globe to, to, uh, over long distances. And um, there's a lot of interest in trying to understand how, how mercury is getting into fish here uh, in the Pacific Ocean and other oceans. And that's really the, the ultimate goal of, uh, of my project here. I'm working with Jeff Drazen and Brian Pope. And uh, together, we've been studying mercury starting in the atmosphere. The mercury that is a gas uh, comes across the ocean in the atmosphere, largely from the combustion of coal in Asia. Um, it's deposited in rainfall into the surface ocean, and then it, under, it undergoes a whole series of chemical transformations uh, and ultimately enters into the marine food web. It then works its way up the food web, is bioaccumulated, um, getting to higher and higher concentrations until it gets into top predator fish, uh, where it, it can reach levels that are hazardous for uh, people to consume large amounts of fish. So we want to understand this whole process um, in more detail, I'm here with um, a graduate student, Laura Mata, and together we're doing a whole series of measurements and experiments uh, of mercury throughout this whole, what we call biogeochemical system, uh, in order to understand this, this process better. My name is Laura Mata, and I'm here from the University of Michigan, where I'm currently doing my PhD uh, in geochemistry. Um, we are in the Kilomona at a Station Aloha, which is about eight hours from Hawaii and I'm here doing some photochemistry experiments in mercury. Uh, we're collecting the samples to the mercury isotopes. So all these different conditions is to one, learn how the signature is happening at the pathways, and two, learn more about mercury chemistry. Because for many, many years, people have been studying metal mercury, and nobody really has a clear idea how photochemistry happens. So here we have some mercury two, and metal mercury with a couple dark controls to make sure that whatever we see with the light is not happening by some background reaction. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is the dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. The award-winning Fluid Earth and Living Ocean textbooks are now interactive and online. New activities, updated content, and a teacher community. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now freely available. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org. Welcome back. As we catch up with our next two journalist volunteers, Lillian Williams and Monica Cratch. Lillian and Monica used the opportunity on board the Kila Moana to learn what scientists actually do at sea and then share their experience through the blog Monica, so you're one of our journalists, videographers at sea for this upcoming cruise. Um, tell me a little bit about your role. So I'm gonna be uh, interviewing and filming the science that's happening. We have a team of bloggers so that people can follow along with what's happening on the cruise and uh, be able to update in real time. 
And so what is it about like these science and the science research experience that you want to convey to the public? Um, just that it, it, it's important. And, you know, especially with deep sea, what we're doing here, I mean, there's only been, I think it's 5% of the deep sea that has even been seen or surveyed. So I think it's really important to um, explore this kind of uncharted territory. Well, I can't wait to hear about how your adventure goes and catch up with you on the backside. Yeah, I'm really excited. My name is Hillary Close. Um, I am a researcher at University of Hawaii. Um, I am heading up the large volume particle sampling on this part of the project, uh, which is looking at food sources to the mesopelagic food web. So when you look at just some water in the surface ocean, you have all of these active living cells, a ton of biomass, just one little milliliter of water is packed with millions of bacterial cells. Um, but at the same time, there's all the dead stuff. You don't necessarily want to think about it, but there's all the dead stuff that in, on the land would be buried in the soil is actually just hanging out in the water. Um, so that's as a whole. Uh, so the dead stuff and the living cells we call particular organic matter. Um, and this is a really important uh, piece of the carbon cycle, and that's what we're capturing. So what we're looking at is just all this stuff in the ocean as a possible food source. You can think of it as just really tiny fish food that's just hanging out, uh, but it takes the right organisms to actually access that. So we're looking for chemical markers um, in all these different pools, in the particles, which could include bacteria, um, up into the zooplankton, up into the fish, to try to look for linkages for who's eating who uh, or what. On the particle side, it, it, get, it's, it, it gets pretty fun because you're not just looking at something eating something else. You're looking at bacteria that are sort of interacting with this diffuse medium and um, degrading. So we're looking at the degraders and the effect that they have on the total pool. And then what does their biomass look, at the same, look like at the same time? And then how does that link also to the higher food web? Hi, Monica. It's great to catch back up with you yeah. now that you've been out to sea. Well, it was really incredible. You know, one of the things that was very striking was that there's always something going on. There's never a moment where there isn't something being sampled or some equipment in the water. There's, as you can tell, there's always so many people on deck. And so it was actually really hard to figure out when was I going to sleep if I wanted to film everything <laughs> because, of, yeah, there's always things going on. So you didn't just film things above the water, you actually rigged up some cameras to go down and, and take a closer look. Yeah. So we actually put one of the cameras on a whole bunch of a whole bunch of poles attached together. And so this, these are when we had the sediment traps coming up. So Jeff had hooked it with this big giant hook and um, we're just reeling them up. Coolest thing for me, because I am a biologist, was the recovery of these amazing organisms that I had never even seen before, let alone existed. So it was really, it was really cool. And to talk to Jeff about the different organisms and their adaptations to the deep sea, that was really cool. And they're always just weird looking. I was like, <laughs> that is not from our planet. Like that is, an, <laughs> that is a deep sea alien. Angler fishes are a really diverse group of animals in the mesopelagic, the badipelagic, the deep open ocean. And everybody knows what they are now because everybody's seen the movie Finding Nemo. And they're called angler fishes because they have a little pole right here and that little black dot glows. And I'll show you a video of this in the next slide. But that's an angler fish and it has a little lure dangling below its chin. And then there's the little fishing pole on top of its head. And these things are designed with pretty complex little points and spikes and things, and they mimic little plankton that communicate by flashing on and off. And so when they do this, they're trying to 
pretend they're something else and uh, a fish or a squid would come in, in close to check it out. While you're at sea for the next 10 days, you're going to be um, collecting some video footage that we're going to use in our Voice of the Sea mm -hmm. TV show. And also you're going to be blogging about your adventure. Yes. What are you looking forward to the most? This is what I was interested in when I, you know, a couple years back, and now I get to actually dive into very important research. So I'm just excited to just experience it and learn as much as I can. Okay, what are we seeing? Whales. I was just there helping hands at first and then kind of by the second day I kind of got a, a feel of what we were doing. It was really cool. It's really cool. I love having, you know, a hands-on experience and actually doing something. So it was cool to actually be helping and doing science at a upper level, you know. What was your favorite part of being at sea? Just the experience overall, being on this ocean for nine days. I've never done that. That was amazing. And just getting to meet everybody and like their backgrounds and the simple stuff mm -hmm. along with doing all this like innovative research mm -hmm. they were just you know normal people and we just had a good time. Uh, I learned a lot. I learned how to set up a CTD, um, how to drain it. I learned a lot of procedures in different scientific fields. It was a lot of fun. I've uh, been out here for two weeks. Tonight's our last night. Uh, we've been shooting video, um, taking lots of stills, some great little ocean critters that came up. We've had some beautiful sunsets. Thanks for watching Voice of the Sea. oceans are critical to our cultural, economic, and environmental sustainability in Hawaii. The ocean serves as a source of water, food, medicine, jobs, transportation, recreation, and energy. It controls climate and weather. Kosi Island Earth aims to share this ocean awareness by partnering with local scientists and educators to engage communities and schools in active science learning for an ocean literate population. Kosi Island Earth is working to establish new avenues for connecting research scientists with educators and communities. Kosi Island Earth is enhancing the science and ocean literacy of our island residents and visitors. Kosi Island Earth is connecting scientific research, traditional knowledge, and ocean policy. Kosi Island Earth, bringing together university, government, research, and community partners to improve science education and ocean stewardship in Hawaii. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CRDG's training routes go back over 40 years. Through professional development programs, curriculum workshops, research on teaching methodology, individualized school and district training, and so much more. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, improving schools, improving education. CRDG. Turn your love of the ocean into a lifelong career. Join NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, as we unlock the secrets in the deep oceans, track rapidly moving storms, model climate trends, protect and preserve our marine resources, and so much more. It's all in a day's work at NOAA. Find a career that makes a world of difference, enriching life through science, service, and stewardship. NOAA.